Hello. So for those of you who already know me, you already know that I have a uh, fascination with Japan, Japanese culture and language. You know that I love stories as well. So for today's story, I'm going to confront my biggest fear, uh, which, as many of you know, is jellyfish. They are awful and I despise them. And there is actually an old Japanese fairy story about the jellyfish, and specifically how the jellyfish lost its bones. Um, with, with the old Celtic fairy stories, it's a joke I've often made when telling stories, is that the old Celtic stories always end the same. They always end, and everybody died horribly. You know. Um, the Japanese fairy tales are really interesting because they have... Um, uh, a lot of them don't have these big kind of moral points that we have in a lot of Western storytelling. And uh, a lot of them do end fairly similarly to a lot of the old Celtic stories, not necessarily with everybody dying horribly, but with uh, a lot of the characters, or just one particular character in the story having a bit of a rough time of it. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, with that in mind, the story of the jellyfish and the monkey, or how the jellyfish lost its bones. Uh, this particular version is an adaptation uh, from a compilation by Ye Ozaki, uh, which is available in the Japanese fairy tales, and I'll link that in the in the chat as well. But here we go. Long, long ago in old Japan, the kingdom of the sea was governed by a wonderful king. He was called Rinjin, or the Dragon King of the Sea. His power was immense, for he was the ruler of all sea creatures, both great and small and in his keeping were the jewels of the ebb and flow of the tide. The jewel of the ebbing tide, when thrown into the ocean, caused the sea to recede from the land, and the jewel of the flowing tide made the waves to rise mountains high and flow into the shore like a tidal wave. The palace of Rin Jin was at the bottom of the sea, and was so beautiful that no one has ever seen anything like it, even in dreams. The walls of coral, the roof of jade, and the floors were the finest mother of pearl. But the Dragon King, in spite of his wide-spreading kingdom, his beautiful palace and all its wonders, and his power, which none disputed throughout the whole sea, was not happy, for he reigned alone. At last he thought that if he married, he would not only be happier, but also more powerful. So he decided to take a wife. Calling all his fish retainers together, he chose several of them as ambassadors to go through the sea and seek for a young dragon princess, who would be his bride. At last, they returned to the palace, bringing with them a lovely young dragon. Her scales were glittering green like the wings of summer beetles. Her eyes threw out glances of fire, and she was dressed in gorgeous robes. All the jewels of the sea worked in embroidery adorned them. Well, the king fell in love with her at once, and the wedding ceremony was celebrated with great splendour. Every living thing in the sea, from the great whales down to the little shrimps, came in shoals to offer their congratulations to the bride and bridegroom, and to wish them a long and prosperous life. Never had there been such an assemblage or such gay festivities in the fish world before. The train of bearers who carried the bride's possessions to their new home seemed to reach across the waves from one end of the sea to the other. Each fish carried a phosphorescent lantern and was dressed in ceremonial robes, gleaming blue and pink and silver, and the waves as they rose and fell and broke the night seemed to be rolling masses of white and green fire, for the phosphorus shone with double brilliancy in honour of the event. Now, for a time, the Dragon King and his bride lived very happily. They loved each other dearly, and the bridegroom, day after day, took delight in showing his bride all the wonders and treasures of his coral palace, and she was never tired of wandering with him through its vast halls and gardens. Life seemed to them both like a long summer's day. Two months passed in this happy way, and then the Dragon Queen fell ill and was obliged to stay in bed. The king was sorely troubled when he saw his precious bride so ill and at once sent for the doctor to come and give her some medicine. He gave special orders to the servants to nurse her carefully and to wait upon her with diligence. 
But in spite of all the nurses' assiduous care and the medicine that the doctor prescribed, the young queen showed no signs of recovery, but grew daily worse. Then the dragon interviewed the doctor and blamed him for not curing the queen. The doctor was alarmed at Rinjin's evident displeasure and excused his want of skill by saying that although he knew the right kind of medicine to give the invalid, it was impossible to find it in the sea. Do you mean to tell me you can't get the medicine here? asked the king. It is just as you say, said the doctor. Tell me, wh what is it you want for the queen? demanded Rinjin. I want the liver of a live monkey answered the doctor. The liver of a live monkey, of course, that will be most difficult to get, said the king. If only we could get that for the queen, her majesty would soon recover, said the doctor. Very well, that decides it. We must get it, somehow or other. But where are we most likely to find a monkey, asked the king. Then the doctor told the dragon king that some distance to the south there was a monkey island where a great many monkeys lived. If only you could capture one of those monkeys, said the doctor. Uh, how can any of my people capture a monkey, said the dragon king, greatly puzzled. The monkeys live on dry land while we live in the water, and are out of our element. We are quite powerless. I, I don't see what we can do. That has been my difficulty too, said the doctor. But amongst your innumerable servants, you can surely find one who can go on shore for that express purpose. Something must be done, said the king, and calling his chief steward, he consulted him on the matter. The chief steward thought for some time, and then, as if struck by a sudden thought, said joyfully, I know what we must do. There is Karuge. He is certainly ugly to look at, but he is proud of being able to walk on land with his four legs like a tortoise. Let us send him to the island of monkeys to catch one. Kuragi, the jellyfish, was then summoned to the king's presence, and was told by his majesty what was required of him. The jellyfish, on being told of the unexpected mission which was entrusted to him, looked very troubled and said that he'd never been to the island in question, and as he'd never had any experience in catching monkeys, he was afraid that he would not be able to get one. Well, said the chief steward, if you depend on your strength or dexterity, you will never catch a monkey. The only way is to play a trick on one. How can I play a trick on the monkey? I, I don't know how to do it, said the perplexed jellyfish. This is what you must do, said the wily chief steward. When you approach the island of monkeys, and meet some of them, you must try to get very friendly with one. Tell them that you're a servant of the Dragon King, and invite him to come and visit you, and you can see the Dragon King's palace. Try to describe it to him as vividly as you can, the grandeur of the palace and the wonders of the sea, so as to arouse his curiosity, and make him long to see it all. But, but how am I to get the monkey here? You know monkeys don't swim said the reluctant jellyfish. You must carry him on your back. What is the use of your shell if you can't do that? said the chief steward. Uh, won't he be really heavy? queried Kurage again. You mustn't mind that, for you're working for the Dragon King, replied the chief steward. I'll do my best then, said the jellyfish, and he swam away from the palace and started off towards the monkey island. Swimming swiftly, he reached his destination in a few hours, and was landed by a convenient wave right upon the shore. On looking around, he saw, not far away, a big pine tree with drooping branches, and on one of those branches was just what he was looking for, a live monkey. I'm in luck, thought the jellyfish. Now, I must flatter the creature, try to entice him to come back with me to the palace, and then my part will be done. So the jellyfish slowly walked towards the pine tree. In those ancient days, the jellyfish had four legs and uh, a hard shell. It was more like a tortoise. When he got to the pine tree, he raised his voice and he said, <clears throat> uh, How do you do, Mr. Monkey? It's a lovely day, isn't it? A very fine day, answered the monkey from the tree. 
I've never seen you in this part of the world before. Where have you come from? What's your name? My name is Kurage, or Jellyfish. I'm one of the servants of the Dragon King. I've heard so much about your beautiful island that I've come on purpose to see it, answered the jellyfish. I'm very glad to see you, said the monkey. By the by, said the jellyfish, have you ever seen the palace of the Dragon King of the Sea, where I live? I've often heard of it, but I've never seen it, answered the monkey. Oh, then you, you surely you must come. It's a great pity for you to go through life without seeing it. Oh, the beauty of the palace is beyond all description. Uh, certainly, to my mind, the most loveliest place in the world, said the jellyfish. Is it so beautiful as all that? asked the monkey, in astonishment. And then the jellyfish saw his chance, and went on describing, the, to the best of his ability, the beauty, the grandeur of the sea king's palace, and the wonders of the garden, with its curious trees of white, pink and red coral, and the still more curious fruits, like great jewels hanging on the branches. The monkey grew more and more interested, and as he listened, he came down the tree to step by step, so as not to lose a word of this wonderful story. I've got him, I've got him at last, thought the jellyfish. But aloud, he said, um, Mr. Monkey, I must go back now. Um, as you've never seen the palace of the Dragon King, won't you, won't you avail yourself of this splendid opportunity by coming with me? Then I'll be able to act as a guide, and I can show you all the sights of the sea, which will be even more, more, more wonderful to you, creature of the land. Ugh, I'd love to go, said the monkey, but how am I to cross the water? I can't swim, as surely you know. Oh, well, there's no difficulty about that. I can, I can carry you on my back. No, oh, that'll be far too troubling for you, said the monkey. Oh, I can do it quite easily. I'm, I'm stronger than I look. So you needn't hesitate, said the jellyfish. And taking the monkey on his back, stepped into the sea. Keep very still, Mr. Monkey, said the jellyfish. You mustn't fall into the sea. I'm responsible for your safe arrival at the king's palace. Oh, please don't go so fast. I'm sure I'll fall off, said the monkey. Thus they went along, the jellyfish skimming through the waves, with the monkey sitting on his back. When they were about halfway, the jellyfish, who knew very little of anatomy, began to wonder if the monkey even had his liver with him. Uh, Mr. Monkey, tell me, do you have such a thing as a liver with you? The monkey was very much surprised at this queer question, and asked what the jellyfish wanted a liver for. Oh, that's the most important thing of all said the stupid jellyfish. As soon as I recollected it, I asked you if you had yours with you. Why is my liver so important to you? asked the monkey. Oh, you'll learn the reason later, said the jellyfish. The monkey grew more and more curious and suspicious and urged the jellyfish to tell him, what's his liver for? And ended up by appealing to his hearer's feelings, by saying that he was only very troubled by what he'd been told. The jellyfish, seeing how anxious the monkey looked, was sorry for him, and told him everything, how the dragon queen had fallen ill, and how the doctor said that only the liver of a live monkey would cure her, and how the dragon king had sent him to find one. Now, I have done as I was told, and as soon as we arrive, the palace the doctor will want your liver, so I feel sorry for you, said the silly jellyfish. Well, the poor monkey's horrified when he learnt all this, very angry at the trick played on him, trembled with fear at the thought of what was in store for him. But the monkey was a clever animal, and he thought the wisest plan was not to show any sign of the fear he felt. So he tried to calm himself, and to think of some way by which he might escape. Doctor means to cut me open and then take my liver out. I'll die, thought the monkey. At last, a bright thought struck him. So he said quite cheerfully to the jellyfish, Oh, what a pity it was, Mr. Jellyfish, that you did not speak of this before we left the island. Well, if I'd told you why I wanted you to accompany me, you certainly would have refused to come, answered the jellyfish. Oh, you're quite mistaken, said the monkey. 
Monkeys can very well spare a liver or two, especially when it's wanted for the Dragon Queen of the Sea. If only I had guessed of what you were in need, I should have presented you with one, without waiting to be asked. I've got several. The greatest pity is that, because you didn't tell me at the time, I've, I've left all my livers hanging in the pine tree. You've left your liver behind, asked the jellyfish. Yeah, said the cunning monkey. During the daytime, I usually leave my liver hanging up in the branch of a tree. It's very much in the way when I'm climbing about from tree to tree. Today, listening to your interesting conversation, I uh, I forgot it. <laughs> I left it behind when I came with you. Oh, if only you told me, I'd have remembered it. I could have brought it with me. The jellyfish was very disappointed when he heard this, because he'd believed everything the monkey said, and the monkey was no good without a liver. Finally, the jellyfish stopped. Well, said the monkey, that's too soon remedied. I'm, I'm really sorry to think of all your trouble, but just test, take me back to where you found me and, I, and I'll get my liver. The jellyfish did not at all like the idea of going all the way back to the island again, but the monkey assured him that if he would be so kind as to take him back, then he'd get the very best liver and bring it with him next time. Thus persuaded, the jellyfish turned his course towards Monkey Island once more. No sooner had the jellyfish reached the shore than the sly monkey landed, and getting up onto the pine tree where the jellyfish had first seen him, cut several capers amongst the branches with joy at big, safe, big home, and then looking down at the jellyfish said, So many thanks for all the trouble you've taken. Please present my compliments to the Dragon King on your return. The jellyfish wondered at this speech and the mocking tone in which it was uttered. And he asked the monkey if it wasn't intention to come with him, though. You, you're getting your liver and coming back, though. The monkey replied laughingly that I can't afford to lose my liver. It's far too precious. But you promised, said the jellyfish. Well, that promise was false. And anyway, it's now broken, answered the monkey. And he began to jeer at the jellyfish and told him that he had been deceiving him the whole time. That he'd got no wish to lose his life, which he certainly would have done if he'd gone to the Sea King's palace. Of course, I won't give you my liver, but come get it if you can, added the monkey mockingly from the tree. There was nothing for the jellyfish to do now but repent of his stupidity and return to the dragon king of the sea and confess his failure. So he starts sadly, slowly to swim back. The last thing he heard as he glided away, leaving the island behind him, was the monkey laughing at him. Meanwhile, the dragon king, doctor, chief steward and all the servants were waiting impatiently for the return of the jellyfish. When they caught sight of him approaching the palace, they hailed him with delight, thanking him profusely for all the trouble he'd taken going to Monkey Island and then asked him where the monkey was. And the jellyfish quaked all over as he told the story, how he'd brought the monkey halfway over the sea and, uh, and stupidly let out his commission, how the monkey had deceived him by making him believe that he'd left his liver behind. The dragon king's wrath was great, and at once he gave orders that the jellyfish was to be severely punished. The punishment was a horrible one. All of his bones were to be drawn out from his living body, and he was to be beaten with sticks. The poor jellyfish, humiliated and horrified by all, beyond all words, cried out for pardon. But the dragon king's order had to be obeyed. The servants of the palace each brought out one stick and surrounded the jellyfish. After pulling out all of his bones, they beat him to a flat pulp. They took him beyond the palace gates and threw him into the water. Here he was left to suffer and repent his foolish chattering and to grow accustomed to his new state of bonelessness. And this is how the jellyfish lost his bones. <laughs>